Hey guys, what's going on? This is the Your Forest Podcast, and I'm Matthew Kristoff. I started this podcast because I wanted people to have access to information regarding the environment, environmental management, and natural resource management, and the science behind it. I find it extremely interesting, and I'm surprised there's not more podcasts regarding these issues out there. So I decided I'm going to do it myself. You guys are probably wondering... What makes me qualified to talk about these things? Who am I? No one's heard of me, I'm sure. And, uh, well, I'm a registered professional forester in the province of Alberta in Canada. And I am deeply invested in nature and the management thereof. I spend a lot of my time out in the woods. I grew up in Slave Lake where I was part of junior forest wardens. Both my parents are foresters. I spent all my time outside hiking, camping, fishing, hunting, quadding, uh, anything you can imagine. It was uh, was awesome. I loved it. And I just want everyone else to have that opportunity. So I went into forestry to try and protect those resources and make sure they're available for generations to come. And this podcast is going to be hopefully informing the public, informing people that aren't knowledgeable or maybe are slightly knowledgeable, give them more information regarding these issues and yeah so we can have a more informed populace i think there's nothing wrong with having people knowing a little more information about something that they deal with every day like trees and wildlife and the air we breathe and climate change and everything else you can think of there's so much there's so much to talk about so thank you for listening and uh yeah here goes the first episode this is the your forest podcast and today we're going to talk about Public land, public land management, mostly the environment, forestry, natural resource management, that kind of stuff. So we're going to start it out talking about how the forest in Canada, Alberta specifically, because that's where I practice. Yep. And I know most about that, but I'll expand my knowledge as this podcast goes on into hopefully other provinces. And British Columbia is some kind of strange world. puzzle mystery I've never even attempted to solve. Yeah, lots of yeah. big trees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like... <laughs> You go for a drive in Victoria, and you're like, I, I, I'm out of my field. I don't understand the ecology. The trees are too tall. Yeah, I have grass in Alberta. I, didn't I just drive <laughs> home until I see grass, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I basically wanted to just talk about, explain to the public that uh, forests in this country are all publicly owned. They don't belong to any private land. Only, I think, 94% of the forest land in Canada is owned by the public. It's public land. Yep. And, uh, yes, yeah, so only 4% of it is, is privately owned, so you don't have to worry about anyone Six. clear-cutting or 6%. 6%. Yeah, math. Math. Math is good. <laughs> We're professionals. <laughs> Podcasting. The other 2% is lost to the uh, yeah. statistics. Good old first-time podcast. Someone said other. We don't understand what Brain is not working correctly, so matter. that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. We'll get there, folks. Don't worry about it. Even though there's nobody listening yet, but if you're listening to this, congratulations. <laughs> you're the first. <laughs> the first person to listen to this podcast and i am sorry <laughs> it's probably us <laughs> <laughs> yeah Pretty, actually yeah we'll be yeah. the first one we just so. have our heads down wincing at our own work yeah, yeah. yeah exactly yeah so uh yeah the forests belong to the people and uh yeah you have a say in what is how it's managed how it's used how the the forest is divvied out if you where the timber is taken from yep. all kinds of different stuff if you just speak up but most people don't know most people don't speak up so nobody you know, people just really know. So a lot of um, stakeholders, right? So the mills, um, people that produce lumber, people that produce fiber, they're calling for public consultation in the form of an open house, right? Yeah. I think that's what they call it, open yep. house. And so usually they're advertising. I mean, most of the forests are around the smaller towns, right? It's very mm-hmm. rare that you'll get a, a town hall in Edmonton called for an area up by Slave Lake, right? Yeah. And true. so I think they advertise mostly in like the paper uh, they can do a lot of different things, but yeah, for the most part right now, there's not a lot on social media as far as I know. The people I've talked yeah. to, they're kind of searching for that, so that's kind of what this was supposed to be for. Yeah. I was just, you know, I decided to do this because I wanted to uh, you know, get the information out there. So this is first step and hopefully public consultation for forestry companies and the government and anybody interested in natural resource management. It is a little bit of a gap in a world where a lot of people get their news on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless like your local small town newspaper decides to post 
that open hall to their Facebook, you know, news feed. Yeah. Then it doesn't get to a lot of people. Yeah. No, there's not a lot of people getting the information, that's for sure. You're typically hitting an older demographic when you're advertising with the paper. So. Yeah, it's tough to get, yeah. So Yeah, it's tough to get young, involved people. Or mm-hmm. There's probably a lot of people that are really conscientious about it but don't know how to get yeah. involved in their consultation The up-and-coming generations. Yes. Like our generation. Like our generation. Look how involved we are. Yeah. We went into the industry to be part of the solution. Go ahead, people. Guess how old we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm 17. Yeah. <laughs> So anyways, uh, I guess I should uh, introduce Derek. I didn't really do that. Right but uh, Derek is also a uh, registered forestry professional in Alberta. So we both know a little bit of what we're talking about. I wouldn't say we know everything, but we know you know as much as the average forester does. So. Our skill set is different, That's good. right? Yeah. Our, our work experience and our, our knowledge differs, right? You're, you know more fire, and I have a little bit of layout experience, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, so talking about public forests. Um, so, s- because they're public forests, you have a say in what's going on out there, but uh, you also can't just go out and do whatever you want because they're not just your forest, they're everybody's forest. So, not one individual can't go out and just do what they want. Um, so, in order to mitigate that, we have public servants, we have the government. The government has, they represent the people. You tell the government what you want to do, and hopefully they will, hopefully, in quotations. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe, but <laughs> yeah. but that's the way it's supposed to work anyways. But you can speak out for yourself as well. It's not just the government. The mills are listening directly to the public, so you can speak to them personally. You don't have to go through the medium of the government. At the end of the day, people really are their customers, right? So if like if one mill, like if Warehouser decided to completely alienate the public through its harvest practices or through cutting a huge recreational area or something, then people are going to pay attention to that, right? We have a whole generation of activists, mm-hmm. and then they're going to specifically be looking to boycott that brand of product. Yep. No, totally. People so. are starting to become more consci- conscientious of uh, what they're buying, for sure. Yep. Yep. No, that's – and that's – we can get in. There's a, there's a lot that goes into that, into the branding and all that, mm-hmm. and we can get into that some other podcast, but uh, – yeah, definitely people who I think are starting to get more more worried about where things are coming from, for sure. Yep. So, um, like I said, public forests, you can't just go out and cut a tree and use it for firewood or build a log cabin or something. You have to go and get permits. You can do those things, but you need to let the government know what's going on because they are trying to manage the whole landscape as a whole. And if you're going out there and doing random things, they don't know what's going on. They can't properly manage for it, and you could be cutting down habitat trees for birds or you could be cutting down just bad areas that aren't going to grow back properly so you're kind of in a sense deforesting you are i mean if you look at like the the permit for firewood gathering or getting a christmas tree in the winter and stuff right that it's like five or ten dollars for that permit i think it's yeah it's like 650 or i don't actually know don't don't quote me on that but yeah it's it's cheap yeah and so when you pay for that they'll tell you an area to say yeah we'd appreciate if you could take that amount of wood from this area Mm -hmm. and really that's going to pay for reforestation or that's part of the budget right so you're cutting that down you're walking away and you don't have to be responsible for that forest coming back yeah it's pretty minimal impact one person here and there but if every person in the province walked out and cut down one tree all next to each other be a huge opening and someone has to put those trees back so just paying that like five or six dollars you know goes towards you know, a good conscience and sustainability and yep. and al- allowing the government to push people to areas that can take the hit of mm-hmm. some firewood or a Christmas tree Yep. rather than all the fur being cut down for freaking 16 mile radius around Edson or something. Yeah, no, totally. Now exactly. it's extirpated or something stupid. If you guys are looking for timber permits, you can actually pick them up online at the government of Alberta website. They're all, they're all there for you. But um, yeah, yeah, you can buy them. You can get the access to that to that wood fiber if you want it. Um, the other thing is they're not just managing wood fiber. These mills are under contract from the government, essentially, not literally, but for this metaphor, they are um, to manage the landscape as a whole, not just the lumber, not just the timber that's out there, but actually managing for everything for the water, for habitat, for animals, for yes, yeah, air yeah. quality, basically everything you can think of. Yeah, when you're planning your harvest. It's 
Do we have any sensitive water courses? Do we have any, you know, at-risk fish species? So mm-hmm. then you'll plan your harvest or your road building operations outside of their spawning periods yeah. when they're most sensitive. And then it's, are we controlling for ungulates? Are we up in the foothills worried about poachers and grizzlies and their habitat? So then you're talking about road closures so that you're not allowing poachers easy access up into their range. And then you're talking about, you know, even planning the retention Believe it or not, clear cutting, you leave some trees. People don't believe that. They do. Um, and you can manage. Clear cutting, whole other issue. Whole, whole other, other issue. issue. Whole other podcast. Everyone's probably. cringing right now. Clear yeah. cutting, it's bad. Well, it's, yeah, I got news for you. <laughs> yeah, it depends. The classic forestry line, it depends. The yeah. answer to everything is it depends. depends. Yeah, let's go with that. Um, but you can manage your, your, um, your retention to yep. create corridors that allow ungulates and other prey animals to move without open lines of sight from predators. So there's all sorts of ways to to manage the landscape and it's it's we're not managing for the trees we're managing the land base yeah but our business or part of the process is harvesting the trees as yeah. a resource that's where the money comes from to manage the landscape yeah somebody has to do it and the private companies do it because they're the ones who can effectively and efficiently manage plan and yeah they can they can do it properly the first time whereas some other organizations like the government doesn't always have the resources they might not be in the area you know, they don't have any, they're using up public money. This way we can utilize private funds to manage public land, but with the public being, you know, the number one priority there. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the government is issuing these permits to manage these land bases with the understanding that we have to protect the forest resource, but we also have to utilize it to meet consumer demand. So there's that balance between the government having to be the protector and having the regulations and and having a level of oversight and then having to meet demand, right? We still need two by fours. We need we need plywood. We need everything. Yeah. Even down to firewood, right? Yep. And down to pulp. Yep. So it's I really like our approach in that we have the efficiencies that come with industry and business mm-hmm. and, and that lean operation. Yeah. I mean, you and I yep. both know that government can get a little bloated in aspects, so I'm quite happy yep. that we don't have completely bloated. 100% government-run harvest operations. I think that would be a bit of a strain. Yep. Yeah, no, for sure. No, it definitely makes a big difference having you know private companies do it because they can, they can do it right, and they want to do it properly. People, people think that, like, oh, they're a big corporation. They're just in it for the profit. They want to get the money and get out. Well, that's not entirely true. It's not true at all. You should talk about annual allowable cut. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to how to get into the sustainable forest management side of it. So a lot of people listening, <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, the do you people want me to listening. try to break it down? Yeah, no, we can, we'll, we'll try and get into it here. So basically, okay. sustainable forest management, like we're talking about, they are trying to manage the landscape, and the trees are just the method by which they get funding to pay for that management. Um, so sustainable forest management from a timber perspective you essentially are cutting down and growing the same amount you're growing back exactly what you're cutting down sometimes more there's there's no surplus of of trees or decrease in number of trees in the the landscape we're not deforesting here that's what people think is going on i think we're deforesting forever the trees aren't going to come back if they come back they're going to be bad they're going to be a monocrop they're going to be sick that's literally not true those things can't happen they're First of all, legally not allowed to happen, but they're also morally and ethically not allowed to happen. People who are managing the land base are, they're like me and Derek or you listening. Like they, they want things to be done properly and effectively, correctly, and in the best interest of the environment, sustainability, and for people. So don't think that these companies are out there trying to make a quick buck because Forestry is literally a not joke. a good way to make <laughs> a bunch of money. A quick buck. Yeah. <laughs> You're not getting rich. Let's put it that way. Oh, um, that's, that's but we get into joke. it. The, the, yeah, people like us, we get into it for the right reasons, right? We want to make sure that the forests are always there. They always exist. The, the resources are there. The animals are there. The water is always there. The fish are always there. The air quality is there. We want to make sure that things are there for our kids and our. For me, when I'm when I'm 90 years old, I still want there to be trees here. So you're gonna be shooting be, deer till you drop dead. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. please, please, let's keep the ungulates going. It's all about <laughs> striking that balance. It's like, oh, I need a two by four today, but it'd be super cool if my grandkids knew what a tree looked like. Yeah, so yeah exactly. It's, it's striking that balance. Yeah, I hope we're not in the good old days. I hope the good old days keep going. <laughs> yeah, the 1940s of hey, do you think we should be replanting these forests? <laughs> I don't know. Let's give it a shot. Yeah, we're not high grading. There's no high grading. We're not going out and cutting 
the giant trees and leaving the small ones to grow where it's a even managed stand process it's everything's done in stages and the the idea is that the age distribution on the landscape doesn't change yep. when you cut down one age distribution it's replaced by another so it should be dynamic but the the distribution should be static over time yeah. that is the theory and we have so much forest in canada and alberta that it works perfectly we don't need to intensively manage we don't need to thin we don't need to prune yeah. uh in some cases people do to achieve certain scientific purposes but yeah we have we have research plots we yeah can. there's research plots there's lots of things going on so that it does not that saying it doesn't happen but on a commercial scale it doesn't really happen it's too much yeah. yeah we don't need to do it we have a lot of land and it most of it a lot of it is left for natural you cut it and it grows back especially deciduous stands aspen yeah. stands and stuff conifer a lot of times you have to plant but once they're there a lot of times they grow back and people also have the mills for example or the government if they're the ones responsible for the replanting which is we can talk about tenure types later i think a different podcast will talk about tenure yeah, types that's, that's a whole other bag of, of worms but uh tenure is how they make agreements to manage the right we should explain that yeah and it's at different scales this so is why derek's your, here to uh Dial me back because just to find things because we're yeah. so used to our terms. So yeah. it's the difference between, uh, a, like for example, you can have an Aboriginal community that's managing an area for firewood. That's a different scale of logging than when you have West Fraser who's trying to produce dimension lumber for an entire market, including Japan and the United States and the Canadian market. Yeah. So that tenure type is the scale of your timber management. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. What the hell are we talking about? <laughs> Um, so, so we're talking about <laughs> sustainable forestry. So the way I always like to think about it is you take your your land base, your productive land base. So those are trees that you can manage and trees that you hypothetically want to harvest. So let's say it takes 100 years for that kind of tree to grow back or for that land base to come back to where it is when you first cut it. So then you take your entire land base and you divide it by 100 mm. into 100 even pieces. If it takes 100 years, you divide it into 100 even pieces. And then you cut that much every year mm. so that when you're you cut one and then you cut your second piece the next year and then your third piece the third year by the time you get to your hundredth year and you cut that last piece that first piece is a hundred years old again and it's ready to be cut and then you go back and you start again yeah and so you're always and that creates the mosaic which is so important it's very very important for forest ecology to have different ages and different uh, species compositions on the land base it supports different wildlife and different uh different ecology yeah that's awesome i'm glad you explained it that way that's a yeah it's a good way to do it that makes sense cool um so yeah so we're talking about all this sustainable forest management and how we do these things and there is so much to talk about we could go on forever but specifically i want to talk about the fact that it's public land yes so uh we're saying how it is public land but you can't go out there and do whatever you want people are managing it and so because it's managed for everybody, we have, some people have to restrict access. Sometimes access has to be stopped because people are going in with, let's say, ATVs and running up potential, you know, fish habitat or yes. making making problems. Right? You can be going in. It can be a public health thing. It can be a species at risk thing. Yep. Some a lot of caribou areas in Alberta, I know, are, they can actually they're legally allowed to close the gates behind them, not let public in because it is a very sensitive area. So, and that's a good thing. We want the caribou. They're yes. a good thing. We want them around. We want to maintain that diversity. Yeah, they're, they're part of they're part of the the ecosystem, part of the web, right? Part of the food chain. They have a role. Yeah. So, anytime you pull one or more things off, it throws a million more out of balance. Yep. No, we want to try and keep them here. Yep. It's yep. an important part. Definitely. And the other thing that can be restricted for is for fire bans, that kind of stuff. Because yep. if if we're in a high high fire risk area um atv traffic or or vehicle traffic it can cause fires you can have especially atvs going through muskeg going through high grass the muffler is hot everything. mud it all gets caked up into the wheels and by the muffler and it heats up and it falls off and yeah, it ignites and it then ignites, it slowly burns yeah slowly burns out and it could actually it creates a whole forest fire like that's absolutely lots of them start that way and then you have like 
you have people who want to have like a small little cooking fire. They're in the way back bush and they want to heat up their lunch or whatever. They got a can of beans they packed in. Yeah. So if they don't put that out properly, that can sit and smolder in the ground for days or weeks. Yeah. Until it hits, you know, the right conditions to pop up and now oh, it's yeah. a full blown forest fire. Yep. And you can have, you know, there's cigarette smoke. There's, there's a million different ways that people generate heat. Oh yeah. And no, sparks it's, an open flame. Yeah, no, it's wild. I uh, I did hack for three summers when I was doing my What's degree. Hack? Hack is uh, hell attack, so it's wildland firefighting, and you're basically flying around in a helicopter, finding smokes and taking care of them, right? You're trying to put them out. Hopefully, you get there when they're still small, and you can do it with a four-man crew, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes you need water bombers, you need helicopters to bucket on them, all kinds of things. There's there's cats, there's a million different things you can go with, but uh, specifically talking about fire starting because of people, I had one situation once when uh, there's a hot dry windy day and it had been that way for about a week and so hazard was high and we got a call to a smoke so we jumped on jumped in the helicopter flew off went to go to the smoke and it's right along the highway so immediately we're thinking people are thinking absolutely you never know if people throw cigarette butts out it's not often cigarette butts but that happens uh it takes it needs to be really dry if it is really dry cigarette butts can totally totally start a fire um or sometimes people are just being assholes Yep. And they'll just, you know, they'll be throwing matches out the window and it happens. It's, yeah, so, but turns out we got there and we landed on one. By the time we landed on one, there was three other ones started further down the highway. So immediately we're thinking arson. We're thinking someone's just being ridiculous. They have no respect for the natural world or people or, because there's, there's homes around. There, there's, there's, you know, resources at stake besides just wood, right? There's, yeah. there's well sites. There's the highway. There's people on the highway. There's cabins in the woods. All kinds of things to worry about. Anyways, by the time we landed, we took care of the first three fires. The third one, I think, was a little bit bigger, so we waited a while, and we sent the helicopter ahead because we saw the fires weren't stopping. The helicopter literally flew ahead of all the fires, found the cause. The cause was an old couple, an older couple, Aww. senior couple. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how old. I know they're, they're in their 70s or 80s, and uh, they were towing their trailer with their small car and the trailer had lost its axle oh, no. so they were and they had been driving i forget how how far it was they were shooting sparks into the ditch and starting force yeah i think i can't remember exactly the number but i think it was something like 18 fires they started That's before the helicopter landed in front of them on the highway to stop them get out of town yeah so oh. And that's pretty hard to do. I mean, I don't understand. I'm not sure what was going on, but there's some <laughs> so a, a good a good point to mention is that helicopter pilots that work on fires are like equal parts skill and insanity. Yeah, no, yeah. for sure, definitely respect. So yeah, so things like that, you know, sparks coming off of trailers. If you blow a tire, as simple something as simple as that it doesn't have to be an axle falling off. It can be blowing a tire and the rims grinding and starting forest fires. It could be. Any number of things. Like, it, it happens so easily, right, when it's hot and dry and windy, especially windy. Um, it takes a lot less than people think. So, yep. right now, British Columbia is basically burning, like the whole province. Basically, yeah. 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 Essentially, if it has ground, <laughs> it it's on fire. Yep. And being British Columbia, it's all hill. So, any fire at the bottom of a hill immediately races up the, the slope very quickly. And they've had they've been on, like, extreme fire hazard for a few weeks. Everyone knows the province is burning. Everyone knows that it's a terrible situation. And there's still stories coming out of people that are, like, barbecuing. So they go to a campground or a little day-use area, and they start up a barbecue. And there was a, a video I saw on Facebook, and their barbecue had blown over. It was just, like, a little portable charcoal thing. It had yeah. blown over. Of course, the hot coals immediately started a grass fire. Yeah. Then ran up a hill into a patch of pine. And so there's just this huge Bye -bye. fire in this patch of pine. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I just thought I would cook some burgers for lunch. It's like yeah. you need to you need to understand that managing the forest for the well-being of the public means that sometimes you can't have burgers for lunch in the park. Yeah. Sometimes you can't put your quad back there, no matter mm. how much, no matter how many taxes you pay, yep. or how many how involved you are in the process. Yep. Sometimes for for there to be a forest for everybody, you can't be in the forest that day. Yeah. No. Exactly. And that's the thing. Yeah. And the other thing is, yeah, like you said, campfires that people have they thought they put out. That's a huge one. That's probably the biggest one. Massive. Is that People thought they stirred them up. They poured water. They stirred them up. There's no smoke coming off of them, but they didn't stir them up enough. There can be ashes that can burn for weeks. Fruits. If you're like, yeah. 
you're not in a uh, actual constructed campground mm-hmm. and you're just random camping yeah there can be roots that start smoldering and yep. just like a cigarette yeah it's just burning 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 up the length until it eventually catches yep. days or weeks later yeah no there's you talk to uh people doing hell attack like i was saying the wildland firefighting and they'll tell you that a lot of the fires they end up on are holdover fires they're fires that started from an old lightning strike or an old campfire or whatever it was and they started initially and they got into the root system and they just stayed in the root system they could stay there for hours days weeks even and one day they'll pop up and that's that's what it is so it's it happens all the time it's it's all not surprising time. so you have to be really careful out there so that's why you can restrict access it's it's like i said it's not your forest technically even though that's the name of this podcast mm-hmm. it is your forest but it's everybody's forest it's everybody's forest <laughs> so we have to manage for everybody your opinion definitely counts especially if your opinion is loud mm-hmm. and you get backing behind it and just know that there's people out there listening and they want to know what you want because yeah your yeah. your opinion matters industry wants to know government wants yep. feedback even if you think what you want is silly or uninformed or whatever let them know and they can tell you they can tell you why that doesn't make sense why that doesn't work or why it wouldn't be the best way to go about things why they have a better way to do it right so just just open up the conversation talk to people uh if you want to know you can find out you just have to try so yeah so forestry professionals like matt and myself our obligation is actually first to the public Mm -hmm. so if our employer wants us to do something that we know is not sustainable or it's unethical like our obligation is to the public and to our set of ethics and our set of morals yeah so i can refuse things i can report employers for um, bad behavior or yeah unbelievable totally. asks. that's why we have a, a college yes we have, we a, have a regulatory body yep. that's meant to keep the members accountable and um yeah so if matt tells me to cut down every tree between here and slave lake because he wants all the wood even though they're only allowed to take. I do want all the wood. You do want all the wood, even <laughs> though um, you're only allowed to take, you know, one one hundredth of that a year or something. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm not going to do that. And I'm yep. going to go after you. I'm going to be like, you can't cut down a yeah. hundred years allotment of wood in one year and think that that's sustainable. Yeah. No. Even people within the industry are watching out each other's backs in the sense that making sure that no one's doing anything unethical or unsustainable. Because, like I said before, that's our number one priority. We didn't get into this to make money, although we are getting paid. But it's a reasonable amount. I got in I got into forestry <laughs> to be part of the solution. Yeah. I, I want to be the one that's watching. So the government says these are the regulations. I want to be the guy on the ground that's putting the regulations in place. I want to be tying the ribbon. I want to be writing the plans. I want to be the one that I know it's going to be cut or it's going to be built according to proper regulations and proper policy. Yeah. That it protects the, the viability of the forest. Yeah. I wouldn't say I got into the forest industry in order to cut down trees or to build homes or anything like that i got into it because i grew up i grew up in a forestry family we spent all our time in the bush i grew up hunting and fishing and quadding and camping and i was in junior forest horns when i was a kid we stayed multiple multiple times in uh, lean twos in the middle of winter and just enjoying nature in general right and that's i think every forester i can think of is that way yeah. Everybody, they all want they all want the force to be around. We love it. We want it there. That's why we're doing this, so that it's done right and not not taken over by some random Chinese company and <laughs> and yeah, and all just like mowed and turned into Nothing, one yeah, yeah. species that's perfectly planted and rode like a crop. Yeah, field we don't grow. want it to be like an agriculture system where it is a monocrop and it's not sustainable, and that you have to put additives into the soil or you have to manage it very intensively. Right? We want this to be a natural system where we can cut the cut the timber as if it were, you know, mimicking fire. I know there's a lot of for the foresters listening, there's a lot of controversy around the mimicking fire specifically, right? But there's we won't get into that right now, but uh we're doing our best so that the cutting practices are sustainable and they're mimicking natural disturbances, not just these big, you know, square yeah. cuts anymore. So like the, well, that did happen in the past, it was still done thinking it was going to be at the time, it was the proper way to do it. We thought that was a good, sustainable way to not fracture, fragment, I should say, the landscape too much. But turns out it wasn't the best. Yeah. So we are we moved on from there. But we're, we're cutting with the idea of working with tree physiology and tree ecology. So when we cut a pine stand, for example, we're clear cutting because pine traditionally is refreshed with fire. Yeah. So that's a large-scale disturbance that wipes out you know, virtually every stem 
in that stand. Yeah. And then when you have the seedlings that are trying to come up, they require full sun. Yeah. Like, no shade for pine. No, like pine and aspen, right? They're pioneer species. They mm-hmm. need full sun. So if we were to do a selective cut and go through and only take every third tree in a pine stand and then plant little pine seedlings underneath, they're just going to wither and die. They're, they won't be productive. They won't be healthy. Mm-hmm. So we're cutting different species or, or different parts of the land base with how the trees grow and how they're going to thrive. Yep. There's a lot of science behind it. There's, yeah, like I said, uh, people go to school for a lot of years to do this properly, to learn about it. Uh, There's a lot of scientific studies going on all the time because we want to get your doctorate in forestry. Yeah. We want to make sure we're doing it right. So don't think that it's just a bunch of random, you know, lumberjacks going out there. (laughs) Every day I put on a cowboy hat. I hop in my super jacked up F-350. I point to the horizon and I say, I'm going to go get me some trees. (laughs) Although I will say it is odd that I'm not wearing plaid today. I guess it's hot in summer. Yeah, it is summer. That's it. That's, yeah, scratch that. Don't listen to that. Yeah. Plaid is for winter. Yeah. Let's go with yeah. Let's go with that. That is for winter. <laughs> Actually, it is. Anyways, I might cut that out. That was dumb. Forestry and fashion advice. <laughs> <laughs> you got to diversify your economy. Okay. But uh, yeah, so yeah, the science is there, and you can look it up if you want to look up sustainable forest management. If you want to learn more about forestry, it's all available for you, and hopefully, this podcast will provide you with more information. Uh, what else can we discuss? It's hard to navigate the world of forestry and make it into a small, short, somewhat interesting podcast, but uh, we'll get there. Hopefully this podcast goes on for a long time and we can get get through every subject, get through the interesting ones, get through the, the basics, which is what this is, just getting people informed on what's going on out there and how things are being done, because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people think that we just go out there and cut willy-nilly and do what we want to do and you know, without any repercussions towards the public or environment, but that is absolutely not the case whatsoever. It is the exact opposite of that. I would, in any case, I would say that people that I know in forestry are probably the most passionate people about the environment, forestry, and sustainability that I know. And people don't see that, but uh, it's the truth. See, the funny thing is, the fact that the vast majority of the public have never met a professional in forestry, they've never had to deal with one, yep. means we're doing our job. Yeah. It means you went out to the forest and there was a forest and you went out and you found deer and there's fish yeah, and there's places to camp and there's firewood and yep. everything is there. Yeah, it's still there. Yep. And somehow it's, you know, it's, it's all been going this whole time and you, you're pretty much ignorant to it. Yeah. It means we're doing a good job. Yeah. It means you're getting everything you want. Nothing's burned down. There's no crisis. There's no alarms going <laughs> off. You know? It's just Derek like, likes you, to pat himself on the back. Yeah, I personally did all of this. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're all welcome. You have two by fours in campgrounds because of me personally, specifically. Yeah, no, no, he's you know, he's got a point. He got a point for sure. No, it's, it's definitely true. We don't have we're not in the paper all the time. We're not. You don't see a lot of hurrah and people, you know, yeah. up in arms about forest practices. But honestly, that has a lot to do with people not knowing what's going on out there. And like Derek said, we do have forests. We do have deer. We do have. We do have birds we do have all the things that we're supposed to have and people just yeah they don't worry about it then which is good they, when but. they talk about social license anytime you have a uh, an industry that's regulating itself mm-hmm. that means it has um it has a, a public I'm trying to think of the word for it um it has the public's trust Yep. When an industry loses the public's trust, yeah. that's when there's outcry. Yeah. That's where the government has to step in. And yeah. The government has to regulate an industry. Yeah. And yeah, I think you you want the private sector to be managing these things because they like like Derek was saying, they're streamlined. There's not a lot of overhead. Things are done for the right reasons at the right time. They don't take forever to get done, so it's good. Although the government is important, it has huge roles to play. They are the ones that are, you know, making sure that companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing and people are doing what they're supposed to be doing and so that everything can work properly which is good needs to happen yep there's a series of fees and penalties that apply to all sorts of processes to do with the harvest or the uh the the level of reforestation whether or not it's acceptable there's there's all sorts of um negative incentives Mm -hmm. that uh that can happen if you don't reforest properly you cut too much if you're wasting the fiber Oh, it's big time. Yeah, no, you can't you can't mess around out there. It has to be done correctly the first time. And if uh if it's not done correctly, you have to redo it. You have yep. to pay for it on your dime. And uh yeah, that's just that's just the truth. It has to be done properly. And we all want it done properly. I'm sure you do too. So Yeah, so that's uh 
Hmm. You know what I'd love? I would love for anyone who listens to this to send in a question or like something they've heard, even if it's gossip. Oh, I heard I was just talking that we're about using that. I was just thinking genetically about modified uh, seed stock. Like we have genetically modified trees on the land base. Or yeah. I heard that um, clear cutting is bad everywhere. Mm-hmm. They're clear cutting the redwoods on the on or the, the coast. Fire is bad, or, or that bad. fire fire is a tool and forestry is bad. Mm-hmm. You know, it's fire is always bad. So yeah. I've heard this, or this is my opinion, or why mm-hmm. why does forestry do this? Why and don't get us wrong for the people that who have lost their homes to forest fire. I personally, I grew up in Slave Lake, so I have family members who lost their homes to fire. That is bad. We're not saying that fire burning down communities is ba- is not bad. It is obviously horrible, but. Yeah. Understand that fire is has always been on the landscape. It is necessary for the boreal forest to regrow itself. It's more so than necessary, it drove the evolution of the tree species exactly. on the land base. Yeah, it's been around that long that it impacted evolution. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, it needs to be it there. It's super important. And yeah. yeah, the fire is a whole whole other bag of worms. Like That'll I said, be a podcast. yeah, that's a whole. <laughs> I'm gonna have a whole episode. podcast. That one's gonna be probably a long how a many, long podcast. How many separate podcasts have we generated? So far, tenure? I'm gonna have to listen to this. And okay, so we got tenure, we got fire, fire, we've got uh, more in depth about sustainable forest management, the things that are included. So there's actually, a, yeah, there's uh, the things that are specifically being managed for. I can tell you right now, just so you guys know what's up. We're gonna have to do a MythBuster episode. <laughs> oh yeah, no, definitely. That the misconceptions are the things that I want to get to, right? Absolutely. So the things that they specifically plan for. Are things like biodiversity, so that means plant biodiversity, species biodiversity, and animals, fish, all that. And also ecosystem productivity, so that is literally maintaining the productivity of the land base, not from well, all from a wood fiber perspective, but also from any other resource that could possibly be utilized on the land base. Yeah. And by utilized, I don't mean used up; I just mean enjoyed or. It's also kind of the the vigor. Of the growth, right? Yeah. The are, they, are they growing productively? Or are they growing sickly? There's all sickly? kinds of... Yeah, we'll go into the yeah. details of, of all these all these things. There's soil and water protection, sustainability, global ecological cycles, and multiple use values to society, like global aboriginal use, ATV, so camping. Yeah. What's that? Global like ecological values are so important. Global ecological Yeah, that's that. That's huge. You want to talk about, <laughs> oh, we, we don't just manage trees? It'd be like, hmm, how does this rain cycle affect, you know, the precipitation level in Russia? Or, yeah. hmm, the, the rainforest, um, the Amazon rainforest is affecting the rainfall in parts of Africa. Yeah. And their wet seasons aren't as wet anymore because the deforestation to produce, you know, This is why I had you on the podcast. Soy for cows. You guys just to talk randomly about... Random facts that affect forestry. It's nice. I like, although you're not always going to be on the podcast. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? My vanity means. Although you can I'm be on the podcast here. anytime you want. I think being the first first guest gives you the right to come on whenever you want to. Whatever. Next time you got something to say. It's your baby. Tell me when you need to babysit. When you want me to. Probably pretty often. Right on. You might be on the first like seven because I, I don't know what else. Nothing to else do. going on. <laughs> that's the biggest thing. You're like, hmm, who doesn't have plans on a weeknight? Hey, Derek. <laughs> you like to talk though. That's that's the main reason. I was like, <sighs> this guy's passionate. This guy likes to talk about things. Try to stop and he keeps me. tabs on it. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm that guy flipping their their shit on Facebook about things. <laughs> I'm the one freaking out like. But the deforestation in the rainforest. You don't yeah. even know what it's doing to parts of Africa. Yeah. Deforestation. Whole other podcast. It's not, it's not <laughs> replenishing the snow packed <laughs> groundwater table depletion. Yeah. No, exactly. Drought. Well, I think uh I think as an introductory podcast, that pretty much covers the basis. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Sorry if I was talking a little fast. First time podcaster, you know, I gotta get the nerves under me and hopefully eventually you guys can understand what's going on. <laughs> So, yeah, I uh, created an email. You guys can email me. Feel free to ask questions, and I will try to get to as many as possible, if not all of them. The email is yourforestpodcast at gmail.com. That's yourforestpodcast at gmail.com. Go ahead, send me an email, and I'll get back to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.